Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be working with custom editors inside Unity. So I'm going to show you guys how to set up your project to use custom editors and how to write a basic custom editor script to control which values appear and hide in the inspector window. If you don't know what custom editors are, they're basically just a way to streamline your development to make your life easier. They're not strictly necessary and you probably don't need them at all. So if you don't, don't watch the tutorial but they can be quite helpful in certain scenarios. First things first, we're going to set up the basic folder structure. So I'm going to create a folder called scripts for all of our scripts. Inside the scripts folder, I'm going to create two folders. One of them is going to be called editor. This editor folder is going to contain all our editor scripts. So the scripts which actually control which values appear and hide and whatnot. The other folder is going to contain all our normal scripts. So we're going to call this runtime. And this contains obviously the runtime scripts, things like mono behaviors, like character controller or anything else like that. That's going to go in our runtime folder. Inside the runtime folder, we're going to create an assembly definition reference. These look like puzzle pieces and basically they do have a naming structure. They're not strictly important naming structures, but stick to them just because um, good practice. So they're going to be called com dots. And then this is going to be your company name. So insert company name here for me. I'm just going to put my first name. If you don't have a company, then just put your first name. Then you're going to put dots and the second section is going to be called your project name. So for example, if my project was called Mario, I'd say com.erin.mario, right? It's not called Mario. So I'm just going to call it sample. And then you're going to put another dot and then you're going to put runtime because this is in the runtime assembly. So to reiterate, it's going to be com.yourcompany.the name of your project dot runtime. The root namespace should be your project name. So for example, if it was Mario, it'd be mario.runtime. For me, it's going to just going to be sample.runtime. The root namespace is kind of important. So use it, uh, make sure you do that and make sure you stick to the na naming structure. Also press apply at the bottom and that is it. Now, if you start getting a bunch of errors, the things like saying, oh, you know, input system not recognized, etc., etc., that's because we don't have the references for that. If you actually go into here, the assembly definition references, you press the plus button and then you go to the, here. You can actually select all the assembly definitions that you have in your project. There should be a lot of them by default. Things like 2D tile maps. If you're using tile maps, you'd want to make sure you select these so that you reference them. Otherwise you will get errors. Now going back to the editor folder, we're going to create another assembly definition. And this one's going to be the exact same name. So dot sample and instead of dot runtime obviously dot editor i'm sure you guys saw that one coming the root namespace is going to be sample dot editor now this editor needs to reference our runtime assembly so to do that obviously we're going to go here like i said select the assembly and you'll see here that we have com dot errand dot sample dot editor that's this one we're going to select com dot errand dot sample dot runtime press apply and that is it so now it's time that we actually create one of our scripts so Inside the runtime folder, I'm going to create a, another folder and I'm going to call this player, right? So all our player scripts would go in here. For example, this could be whatever structure that you want to organize your scripts in. But for me, this is what I'm going to do. So inside the players folder, I'm going to put my player script. So let's create a new, new C sharp script and I'm going to call this player controller. Let's open up the player controller script inside your code editor of choice. For me, that's going to be Rider. It, I'm not sponsored. I just like the way it looks. <laughs> Again, I'm using Rider. It does look a little bit different to Visual Studio, but a lot of the functions and the commands and stuff are pretty much the exact same. So our player controller is of type mono behavior, and it's got two functions here. We don't need these two functions yet. And then we also don't need these namespaces. We're just going to stick to using Unity Engine. Now on the side here, I'm going to open up our folders. You also have this browser inside Visual Studio. It's just going to be on the right side of your screen instead of the left. If you don't see this window in Visual Studio, you might need to go to window and just make sure that you have that window selected. I think it's the solution explorer window on Visual Studio. Don't quote me on that, but so we're going to create a few player controller variables in here. The first one being, let's say move speed. So we'll have a public float move speed. So obviously this is going to control the speed of our player. Usually you'd say serialized field and you'd say private, and this is how you would bring it up in the inspector. If I jump back into unity, let's create a sample player object for ourselves. So I'm going to go to here, create empty, and I'm just going to call this player. Uh, let's drag and drop our player controller onto here. Boom. We have move speed. Very nice. You could also say public here, and this would also bring it up in the inspector. Although this is usually not recommended because it goes against the laws of encapsulation. And as you can see, obviously public also brings it up in inspector. That's pretty much as basic of an inspector as you can create, right? 
At least for now, we're going to keep it public just so our editor can reference the value of move speed. Later on, I'm going to show you guys how you can make this serialized field and private so that you can still stick to encapsulation if you're going for that clean code speed run. That's one variable. That's not very interesting. Let's create another one. Let's say public. That's not it. Public floats and we'll say gravity. Uh, well, gravity force, right? I'm not actually going to code any of this in. This is just purposes for having some values here, right? So obviously gravity force would be perfect if we had a platformer player. We don't know what kind of player controller this is going to be. So let's just create a new folder inside runtime. I'm going to add a directory and let's call this enums. All our enums for our project is going to go inside the enums folder. If you're not able to create the folders and stuff inside Visual Studio or Rider, then you can just create it inside Unity. So you'd create the enums folder. Inside enums, we're going to create a C -sharp script. And I'm going to call this player type. Let's open up player type. We don't need it to be mono behavior. We need this to be sample.runtime.enums. We don't need to reference any of this. And we actually don't even need the class itself. To create the enum, we're just going to say public enum player type. Let's give it a few values. So it would say top down player or a platformer player, right? There's two types. One of them doesn't use gravity. One of them does use gravity. Inside our player controller, I'm also going to edit this namespace. Make sure that this is inside player. We're going to add public player type. And I'm going to call this player type. You may be getting an error here. Make sure you actually add the using sample.runtime.enums namespace. Obviously for you, this would not be sample. This would be whatever your project name is. If you followed the namespace structure from the start of the video. Now, this is fantastic and all. Um, if I jump back into Unity, you'll see that our player actually has all these things inside the inspector. In fact, for the player type, we'll actually have a drop down if this all worked well. Here we go. We have a drop down, either platformer or top down. That's pretty good. However, you'll notice that we have gravity force for our top-down player. That's not very necessary. We don't need gravity for our top-down player. Let's jump back into our code editor and go to the editor folder. I'm going to add a C sharp script and we're going to call this player controller editor. The way I like to name this is just the name of your script and then editor. At the top, we do need to add using sample.runtime.player because that's the thing we're editing, right? This is going to be inheriting from type of editor in Unity editor. Um, in fact, let's make sure that we include that up here using Unity editor. Cool. You will need to specify Unity editor dot editor because our namespace is also called editor. Um, that's not actually correct. This should be called sample dot editor. Now to make this a custom editor for something, we're going to have to add a few things. First thing we have to add is an attribute. So we're going to open square brackets and say custom editor type of, and the type of we're doing it for is the player controller. Fantastic. Now to actually make this do stuff, currently this won't do anything. If I jump back into unity and go to our player controller, you'll see that it looks the exact same. However, the only difference is that it says multi-object editing not supported. Um, and in fact, if I create a copy of the player and I were to select both of them, you'll see it just says multi-object editing not supported. That sucks. So we're going to open another attribute and say uh, multiple objects. What was it called? Multi can edit multiple objects. That's the one we want to add. That should get rid of that warning for us. Heading back into Unity, you'll see that this error message goes away and we can select both values, uh, both objects and change their values. Back into the editor script, we're going to create a public override, not get hash codes on inspector GUI. Cool. So by default, it's going to generate this for us. It's going to say based on inspector GUI. Basically just makes it say draw the default inspector, right? So draw the default inspector. Fantastic. If I didn't do this, the Unity inspector actually has nothing in here. There's nothing to edit. So we broke it. This is because we actually have to draw each element in our inspector manually. So first things first, we need to have a reference to our player controller that we're currently editing. So we'll have a public, uh, sorry, a player controller PC. We need a private void on enable. On enable means basically when we first add this game object or whenever we enable this game object. PC is going to equal target 
as player controller, not player type, player controller. Cool, now we have a reference to the player controller we're currently editing. So we can say, for example, pc.movespeed equals, and this is where we create a editor um, element. And Unity makes it super easy for us to do this. We say editor GUI layout dot float field. And now we have to name the float field. So let's call it move speed. And we have to give it a value. So the value is going to be PC dot move speed. And that is it. And so now we should get a move speed variable inside our editor. What you'll notice and something that's really cool is we don't actually have that script thing here anymore. That's one of our values. The other value is PC dot gravity force equals obviously editor GUI layout. GUI layout dot float field again, gravity force and PC dot gravity force. That's going to make it draw the gravity one. Um, let's just make sure that this is gravity force. There we go. Um, the only other thing we have to add is the enum. So PC dot player type equals editor GUI layout dot enum pop up. Now the enum selected is going to be player type, I believe. This is how we use this uh, player type. Uh, we have to make sure we label this as well. So we'll say player type PC dot player type. Ah, right. A uh, few things. We have to make sure that this is player type. Um, and I think that should work. If I head back into the Unity Inspector, we're going to see if this does or doesn't work. Here we go. We have all our values here. Okay, fantastic. And we can edit all of these. Cool. Now, obviously, this basically did nothing different than what a custom editor does but because we drew everything by default. <laughs> so now we just have to make it so that we only draw gravity force if the player type is equal to a um, the platformer. And to do that is literally as simple as saying if pc.playerType is playerType.platformer, then pc.gravityForce equals yada, yada, yada. Um, otherwise, we can just say pc.gravityForce equals zero. We should hopefully see that when we select top down, there's no gravity force. As soon as we select platformer, gravity force appears. And I can select this as I wish. Top down, platformer. Um, now, by default, when we go back to top, so for example, if I set this to 10, and then I went back to top down, and then went back to platformer, it sets it to zero. That's because of that else statement here. This may or may not come in handy depending on what you prefer. I generally prefer not to include this because it is kind of nice for it to save the values. Um, and I usually do that check for um, again in uh, code. So it doesn't really matter when I'm writing the inspector for myself. So if I went to platformer now and I set this value to 10 and then I went back to top down and then back to platformer, it keeps the value as 10. One issue here is the fact that we actually can't edit multiple objects and another issue which you may not actually know is for example, if I set custom edit to 15 and then I've said control Z, it doesn't actually set it back to 10. So we're not actually making it so that we can undo or redo stuff. Um, and if I, for example, select both players and set their gravity force to 10, birthday gravity force should be 10, right? But it's not. So multi-object editing is supported but it doesn't work. To fix that, we're going to create serialized fields or serialized properties. So we'll say private serialized, I think it's serialized property. We're going to call this M underscore move speed. On enable, we're going to say M underscore move speed equals serialized object. Uh, serialized, serialized. It's going to be serialized object with a lowercase s dot find property. Here we go. Now the property we're finding is going to be called move speed. Where did this name come from? It came from here, literally the name of the variable. We're going to do the same for all of our fields. So we have gravity force and also player type. Um, and obviously we have to duplicate this as well. So M underscore gravity force and M underscore player type apply this to the variables. You'll notice that these are actually all the same type, despite one of um, them being a player type. We can actually store them all the serialized properties. That's fine. Uh, Unity knows what to do with this. And now when we're changing their values, we can do stuff with them. So instead of modifying PC.player type, 
we can modify m underscore move speed. So m un sorry um, m underscore player type. That would have been disastrous. M underscore player type dot enum value index is going to equal int player type. All right. So how does this work? This returns an enum. Enum pop up returns just the basic enum. We need to turn that basic enum into our player type enum. However, when we're setting the enum value index, that's just the number, um, like, that's just an integer, so zero or one based on our player type. So we need to turn our player type into an integer. What you probably didn't know about enums is that they actually derive from type int. You'll see that this went to gray because it says int is default enum governing type. Every enum is by default an int. So the value of this is actually zero and the value of this is actually one. So when we cast a player type into an integer, that's exactly what it does. You can actually change this as well if you wanted to. You can make this a U short, for example, which is just an unsigned short or an unsigned 16-bit integer, um, which I don't know why you would want to do that, but you can. Back to our editor, we set the enum value index equals to that. So what we can do is control C this and paste this into the player type here. That's going to give us an error because this is an integer, whereas it wants a enum in here. So we have to cast this to player type. Now, all your programmers are probably like, hey, there's too much boxing and unboxing going on here. Uh, that's true. However, for the purposes of a custom editor, it doesn't actually really matter because this is only going to happen inside the Unity editor anyway. Um, so your editor will not behave so much slower that it's unbearable. It literally, it does not matter that much in performance. So calm down. Is there a better way to write this? Probably. Uh, I don't know of it. So feel free to let me know in the comments. I'm always willing to learn more as well. We're going to do the same serialized property stuff for our move speed. So m underscore move speed dot float value this time is going to equal this. And then we're going to copy this and put it here again. So instead of setting the PC dot stuff, we're, we're just going to apply it to our float value. Now we can read this directly from the um, player controller. We can see, we can say PC.player type. That's fine. We don't have to read the enum value index. That's completely okay. But down here, we want to make sure that we say M underscore gravity force dot float value equals float field this. And then of course, M underscore gravity force dot float value. So we basically just switched all our code to use serialized properties instead of directly modifying the uh, player controller. What this means is two things. Firstly, our control Z and all that stuff and multi-object editing will now work. The other thing it means is that these no longer have to be uh, public. These can be private serialized fields. So I'm gonna change this for all of them. So now that means that our custom editor still fo follows encapsulation rules, which is fantastic. The only thing that won't actually work, uh, which I completely forgot about, is the PC.player type, uh, because it's obviously private. You could change this uh, to public if you really wanted to. Um, for my purposes, it's probably not worth it. And I'm just going to say this. And then cast this to an integer. That is completely okay. So I actually forgot to do something as well. We actually have to include these two lines. Serialized object.update and editor GUI.begin change check. We're going to do that at the very start of our on inspector GUI. And we're also going to do edit the GUI dot and change check and serialized object dot apply modified properties. This is quite self-explanatory, but it's going to update the object and then start checking for changes, stop checking for changes, apply the changes. So if I jump back to Unity, let's try messing around the value. So move speed, we can change platformer. Let's make it. Yeah, cool. That works. If I select both objects, let's make both their values 100 and 100. And let's make also both of them top down. Let's see what happens. They are both top down and 100 move speed. Cool. Um, if I select this one and then press control Z, uh, let's for example, make this not 100. Let's make this 150. control Z. It goes back to 100. Nice and easy. That is our custom editor done with serialized properties over here. They're serialized fields, not public anymore, which is fantastic. That just about does it for custom editors inside Unity. The source code for this video will be uploaded onto Patreon. If you want to see more tutorials like this for Unity, make sure you like and subscribe and leave a comment of what you want to see next. I'll catch you next time. Take care and peace.